Do you have a foot fetish or something? No, no, I don't. Well, I think you do. Maybe you should go out and find the perfect set of feet. Well, maybe I will. Do that. Now, I know what you're thinking. Who the hell is this guy laying around dreaming about feet? Well, I'm Calvin Dwight Harris, a bohemian filmmaker who lives in Denver, Colorado. As a track and field runner in college, my feet meant everything to me. But it's more than that. I just really like feet. So join me on my quest to find the perfect set of feet. I hope you find what you're looking for. encountered that I think would be able to get everyone in Guantanamo to give up every secret they've ever had, plus ones they just make up. Hardened criminals would confess the crimes they didn't even commit if they were exposed to this smell. Don't keep the stinky socks and shoes on all the time. It's not cool, man. And when someone says, oh, sorry, my feet must smell, you go, no, 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 they're fine. Oh. Make sure there's not all that stinky crud up on, <laughs> underneath your toe. <laughs> It was like week old roadkill on a hot summer day. Um, there's some really smelly feet out there. <laughs> To the warriors and all those with exposed toes, you're victorious. We just want to raise awareness. Your preparedness allowed you to maintain. You began this journey unsure of what was in store for you. Through this film, we hope to give support to you. So keep walking these streets with your feet. Never accept in defeat. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. The first stop of my journey was to the Colorado Ballet Company, because if anyone would need to have perfect feet, it would have to be a ballet dancer. So, sir, let's get to the heart of the matter. Let's talk about the challenges with your feet. How did you get so good at standing on your toes and being able to perform as a ballerina? You're trained to do that from a young age. So there's a certain age or a certain strength level where they start putting you into point classes. They have your first pair of point shoes, and when you're that young, it's not so much like you see us on stage nowadays where we're just dancing in our point shoes all the time. It's more just about exercises and strengthening your feet in the point shoes, because if you're not strong enough, you will injure yourself. When you get older, you do some variation, so that's when you see somebody doing a dance on their own, and then when you get a little bit older, you start doing partnering work. It evolves, and everybody's very different. There's some girls who naturally have stronger muscles or their muscles take to it very easily and then they'll get a lot stronger quicker and then you have people where you're a professional and you still struggle with weakness of your feet because it's just like you're more flexible so it just takes more effort and coordination and work to 
make your body do what it needs to do. Do you folks do certain exercises or certain things to continue to strengthen your feet? I do. I use do some like TheraBand exercises or I'll wear my point shoes in ballet class and jump in them just because they're harder so it takes more work for you to use your feet while you're jumping. What is it about ballet that keeps uh, driving you to continue in this profession? Because you can never reach perfection with ballet. I see. So if I can never reach perfection, I figure why not give it a try myself? Who knows? I might actually have a second career ahead of me. So let's see what you <laughs> normally would do. Um, I could show you how we start class every day. Okay. With plies and first. Oh my gosh, you're gonna kill me here. That Yeah. and that. That's as far as I'm gonna go. Yeah, I can see how this profession, you have to be versatile and very fit. Mm -hmm. And I, I do not meet either of those requirements, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll admit, that was a lot harder than I expected. I guess that second career will have to wait a while since I'm headed to the Bahamas to visit someone who truly has been hard on their feet. But nobody ever said winning Olympic medals was easy. My name is Jackie Edwards. I went to Stanford University on a track and field scholarship, did well at Stanford. I won NCAA championships twice, and that launched me into a professional track and field career. And so I went into five different Olympic Games consecutively in 1992, 96, 2000, 2004, and then 2008 was my last one in Beijing. I trained five to six days a week, depending on the coach I had four to five hours a day, 10 and a half months a year for 17 years. And now that I'm retired, I look back and I'm like, how did I do that for so long? One thing that you do a lot as a jumper or a sprinter is you roll your ankles, twist your ankles all the time um, running through the sand because the sand is so uneven. So I would have to specifically do exercises to strengthen my feet and ankles. So I would run barefoot on the grass, we would do high knees in the sand. All these things to strengthen my actual feet without my shoes on, so that when my shoes were on, uh, my foot itself was stable and that the shoe was just extra support. So these are a pair of my long jump shoes that I never got to wear. You can see they're still brand new. You can look at the bottom, see how beautiful they are. That pretty gold, I guess they were hoping that I would win a gold medal if I had these gold shoes. Specifically in long jumping, you want your shoe to be as snug as possible without being tight. Because when you hit the board with all that force, you don't want your foot to slide in the shoe. So they really just want your foot to be in place. There's not a lot of torque. Like a running shoe, you could probably bend it. A long jump shoe is stiff. There's no bending of the shoe. You cannot do that, which is good. But there was a period of time when uh, sometimes I walk with my feet out like this and they wanted my foot to be more flat so I had these orthotics. I was just trying to be listening to my coach and wearing the thing but when he was unaware, I just take him out because I just didn't like, it made my shoe so tight and as I said before, the long jump shoe is so snug already. To put that thing in there and then try to fit my foot, I felt like it was gonna explode. It was not comfortable. If you wanna do a sport for a living, make sure you take care of what you need to do that sport. And for me, if my feet were no good, I could do nothing. Now you go to the gym and you watch people work out, 
they'll work out every muscle in their body, right? They're working on their arms, their legs, you know, even their lips sometimes, right, when they're talking, right? But the one part of their body I've never seen anybody in a gym work out is their feet. My name is Kara Dottie. I'm 44 years old. I grew up in Colorado. I am married and I have three children. I've always been interested in figure. I've always been active in fitness. I am what you would consider a gym rat. The difference between what I do and a fitness model is I'm actually a figure competitor. I go and I compete against other women in my same height class or age class. I get up on stage and we do various poses. These are your typical competition shoes. Um, these are what the judges expect to see you on stage. There are different uh, versions of this. Some have the straps, some have the one band across, but they do have to be this plexiglass stripper looking shoe. And I'm not exactly sure why the judges want this, but this is the typical height. Um, you do not see usually any other competitor with a larger heel or a smaller heel. This is what they want you wearing on stage. And they're uncomfortable and they hurt and your feet swell up in them and you got your tan and you've got your oil on top of that. And so you're sliding around on the stage and in your shoes and you're afraid you're gonna fall off. <laughs> So yeah, these are your typical competition shoes. I used to train in the most expensive gym shoe like everybody else had. My arches would kill me by the end of the day and I could not figure out why. And finally I was talking to one of my coaches. I said, you know, my feet hurt all the time. And what he said to me was that your feet have a natural arch in them. And so to train, you put your foot in a shoe that has an arch already in it you're breaking down that natural arch in your foot. So he said, go find the flattest shoes that you can find. I found that my feet stopped hurting and I enjoyed wearing them so much that I wear them all the time. Cardio and weight training is a big important part of the figure fitness community. If your feet are giving you any problems during that time, um, you're not gonna be able to, to reach your competition goals. In the same way that somebody does their work to build their body up and to work on their core strength and to work on their arms or their quads or their hamstrings, people need to train their feet too. And what that means is you have to put the miles on your feet. My name is Marshall Ulrich and I've been running since 1978. First I started doing marathons, then jumped into ultra marathons in 1986. Then it just uh, progressed on and on, so I have run over 125 ultra marathons that average over 125 miles. My wife and I added it up about 90,000 miles of running. One of the places that I made a name for myself was running across Death Valley from Badwater, which is minus 282 feet to the top of Mount Whitney. It's 146 miles. I set the speed record for that back in 1992, and no one's come within six hours of it. Uh, my longest run was across the United States, and it was 3,064 miles in 52 days. So I was averaging just under 60 miles per day for 52 days straight. It was a labor of love. For marathoning, ultra marathoning, even walking, your feet are just essential. If you don't take care of your feet when you're running, you're toast. As far as my toenails are concerned, that's been a topic of conversation. And what I did is I voluntarily had them surgically removed because I was running so many miles, I'd get what is called black toe and it would raise up and fall off eventually. And I was having such a hard time keeping my toenails on that uh, finally I just had them removed. So I don't have them, they don't grow back anymore. And I did that about 20 years ago. The shoes I'm currently running in are called Hoka 1-1 shoes. And I like these shoes because they have a lot of cushioning. So they're sort of the opposite of a minimalistic shoe. There's a lot of cushioning here. There's a lot of beef to it. And so I prefer these shoes. And then what I do is I pull the liner out and I do wear an orthotic. And that provides arch support. It was very painful when I was running across the United States because I didn't have the arch support that I really needed and what I developed was a plantar fasciitis about a thousand miles into the run. 
So for 2,000 more miles, I was running with the plantar fasciitis, and I still have, you know, effects of that. I've got a big lump in there right now. Plantar fasciitis is an inflammation in the band of connective tissue that runs along the bottom of the foot. So the band of connective tissue, it's basically this pink band. It connects heel to forefoot. With lack of support in this area, it's collapsing down and overexerting, similar to a rubber band that you stretch and stretch and stretch and to the point where it develops little micro tears. So internally, it's yanking on the heel. What amazes me about the feet is how durable they are, how much impact they can take, how they can keep going mile after mile, year after year. To not take care of them is, uh, you know, it's not a smart thing to do because, you know, we'll have them the rest of our life and good golly, uh, they've served me well. Well, your feet are obviously very important when you're running those kind of distances and you can deal with a lot of issues. When you have a good pair of socks, you have a good pair of shoes, the running is good and you don't have to worry about what's going to be happening with your feet. When your feet hurt in a race, it affects your overall attitude and can really um, hinder your ability to continue. Every step you take, your foot hurts. And so you've got to take care of your feet right from the start and a lot of people fail to do that. They come into a run and they have old shoes or they have socks that unfortunately have holes in them or their insoles inside of the shoe are paper thin and they don't provide the support. So going into an event, you've got to figure out what my feet need. My name is Nicodemus Holland. I'm from San Diego, California and I've been doing ultra marathons uh, extreme endurance events for the last six years of my life. Back in 2009, I did no foot maintenance. I, I had no idea, you know, a uh, feet or something that I run on, you know, uh, what important, I mean, obviously you gotta have them to run, but other than that, you know, whatever. But I ran Badwater and a pair of Asics from Walmart and a couple pairs of cotton socks from Walmart. And consequently, I had huge blisters by the time I got to mile 70. So Injinji has been a sock that I've been wearing personally for the last three, four years. So prior to wearing Injinji toe socks, you know, wearing what might be considered conventional socks, you know, I would continuously get severe blisters between my toes. The Injinji socks, I became familiar with them about eight or 10 years ago, and I believe it was out in Death Valley before one of the runs. And I was looking for something because I was getting blisters around my toes and I was looking for a sock that would isolate the toes and keep them from rubbing against each other. Once I started wearing in gingy socks, I literally fell in love with them. And as silly as it may sound that a male would become so passionate about an article of clothing, I told all my friends about it. Anybody who would listen, I became truly what was considered a, a raving fan. Wow, with so many people in love with these socks, I just had to go see what they're all about. Off to San Diego to find out if foot gloves are really the future for our feet. Hi, Christine. Hey, Calvin. Welcome to Njinji, home of the original performance toe sock. So, Christine, tell me what was the inspiration behind the Njinji original performance toe sock? Well, really athletes and runners specifically um, and the anatomical design of the human foot. You know, we were given toes for a reason. Toes help us to distribute our weight. They help us with balance and propel us forward. And we didn't feel like there was um, a performance sock in the marketplace that truly addressed the toes and the feet and allowed the toes to splay out and function as they were designed to. When we first came on the scene, there was nobody else doing performance socks with toes. We did not invent the concept of a toe sock. They definitely have been cotton toe socks available in Asia, but we were the first company to get out there and say, no, this is gonna help you reach the peak of your performance. These are better for your feet and they're really going to work in, in running and athletics in general. We've gained a lot of traction in the last, you know, 10 to 12 years in the running, in the running market. We still think that running is the ultimate testing ground for our products. I've seen our sock work in some of the toughest foot races in the world, 135 miles with one or possibly two at the most sock changes and that, that's pretty much unheard of. I know several people who have to change their socks mid-run, uh, several times during a run, treat different feet issues, hot spots, blisters. I don't have any of those problems. You, you think of these ultras as something, you know, oh, you're out there for 24 hours, but 
those minutes that you spend at aid stations and stuff like that, that, that stuff can add up over time. The minutes you might spend, you know, slipping on a sock or something like that. They feel weird at first. The first wear is kind of like, uh, this feels weird, it looks weird. But after three wears, most people are totally sold. The last thing you want to do is get any type of uh, water buildup on your feet. You don't want them to be too moist where they start macerating. Um, anything that wicks the moisture from the skin is great. How do you guys normally encourage folks to try those on? <laughs> <laughs> They look great. I love the colors, and it has definitely that orange flair to it. Yeah. Right. You know, ultimately what we're trying to do is to change people's mind about how they should wear a sock. And it is still a pioneering type of product where you do have to go out there and enlighten people to, you know, why, is it, why do I want to wear a glove on my feet? I mean, even if you don't run, having your toes separated um, will provide the best foundation for doing whatever it is that you love to do. Our feet are like the root on a tree of our whole body. So anybody that comes to our socks, I, I, I usually feel are somebody that are kind of looking for a better way, a healthier way to wear a sock. Everybody has their natural genetic foot position, but there's certain characteristics to how your foot should be positioned if it's functioning in its most efficient manner. So first off, this is an ideal degree. So this down here shows an excessive high arch. This shows a flat foot. So this is the, the angle in which your arch should be positioned if it's functioning um, with less fatigue than normal. My name's Eric Kaplan. Um, I'm the owner of Good Feet. Uh, we've been in business since uh, 2002. When somebody comes in, it's our job to assess the situation without crossing the lines of diagnosing or prescribing to them. So when they come in, we'll ask a series of questions such as, what are your goals? What ailments are bothering you? Uh, what activities do you do? What type of wardrobe do you wear as far as footwear? Um, from there, we will take prints, measurements. You have a heel to toe measurement and then you also have a heel to ball measurement so that's more specific to the bone structure on where an arch should actually fit underneath your foot. We specialize in a system of three different types of support that all work together for different shoes and various activities. This device is called a classic. This is referred to as an exerciser and basically the purpose of this is to balance the weight distribution over the entire foot so it does help to take pressure from the heel, the ball, and inner and outer longitudinal sides to limit rotation. So this device is the core of the products. It's the most effective of everything that we do. Um, but with that said, it's not the most comfortable device as you first begin to wear it. So that's where the other two pair do come in. So this is referred to as a maintainer and it would basically retain the change that this has provided. It's much thinner and sleeker in design, so it's used in a wider variety of shoes for ladies who like to wear sandals, dress shoes, loafers, um, various styles that are more limited in space. The third device that we recommend, this is called a relaxer. And so it's the thinnest and sleekest of the three. The main purpose behind this is to limit barefoot walking at home on hard surfaces. So most people would use this in a slipper to you know, provide minimal support the last couple of hours of the day, but still feel like they're walking barefoot. Basically the system of three will cover all shoes, all activities and goals as far as changing biomechanics to the point where we can usually get to the root of the problem to make them feel better. Arch support is really important because uh, if we lose our arch, uh, in a sense, if we start flattening the arch of our foot, we start getting an inward rolling of the ankle, which in turn is going to start rolling in the knees and the hips and we start having knee hip pain, back pain, those kind of things. So there's a lot of importance to the arch of the foot. It all starts with your feet. So not only are we helping people, you know, feet problems, it's their back problems because it stems from your feet. Let's say somebody comes in with ball of the foot pain. By raising the metatarsal arch, it'll take these bones, slightly elevate them, causing the toes to relax and lay down, whether they're dealing with hammer toes, bunions, upper body concerns. It's effective for all of those areas. 
Um, same thing with the heel. By lifting back here, it takes pressure off of the heel if they're dealing with the plantar fasciitis symptoms or heel spurs or various forms of heel pain. So it's important to wear arch support because naturally we put too much pressure in certain areas and those are usually the areas that cause the biggest fatigue and concern. The arch support is the most important thing that you can put in a shoe. And our product has truly changed so many lives, not just here in Colorado, but across the country as well as the world. The footwear industry for the last 45 years has been telling people a story. And it's a very compelling story. And the story is you need support, you need motion control, you need pronation control, you need an orthotic, you need things under your arch, you need all these things. And there's just not a lot of evidence, like none, that it reliably works. None. Uh, my name is Steven Sashin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Zero Shoes. Six years ago, I got back into sprinting after a 30-year break, and I was getting injured constantly. And a friend of mine suggested that I might want to try taking off my shoes and running barefoot. And then he also pointed me to a book called Born to Run, which talks about the Taramara Indians in Mexico who run for hundreds of miles in just like a piece of tire strapped to their foot. And they run totally pain-free, injury-free till they're in their 70s and 80s. So I took off my shoes and it worked. Um, I discovered when I was running barefoot what kind of form problems I had when I was in my shoes. And by being barefoot, it just cleared those up and I became injury free almost overnight. And I made my first pair of sandals inspired by these Taramara tire sandals. And the gist is that we give you the closest thing there is to a barefoot feeling. Your feet can totally move naturally. They can flex, they can bend, they can grip, you can feel the ground. It's just enough protection so that you don't have to worry about what you're standing on. So our first product was literally just a sheet of rubber, some nylon cord and instructions about how to make your own sandals the same way they've been doing it for 15,000 years. But we knew that the do-it-yourself thing was intimidating for a lot of people. So with the help of our current product designer, uh, we cracked the code and came up with the first redesign of that basic 15,000-year-old sandal in 15,000 years. First, we took the thousands of tracings that we had of people's feet and figured out where that post is supposed to go to handle most people. We changed the shape a little bit so that it doesn't necessarily handle 99% of all people, but 95% because we don't want something too big so that it doesn't work for people. And we figured out a new lacing system that allows for really, really easy and secure adjustment. Uh, and you can just slide your foot on and go. And we added the heel cup, which is partly decorative and partly it helps keep stuff out. It keeps your foot centered. Um, we raised the ankle holes so that the lace never touches the ground. We added this really ultra soft TPU toe post and we're using a 5.5 millimeter rubber. So it's just the perfect amount of ground feel and the right amount of protection for people. The premise in the barefoot running world is that if you use your arches, you're fine. When you put support in something, there's no activity. It's, it's, you're, 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 you're shutting it off and then expecting it to somehow be strong. But if you actually use your feet, you can strengthen and use your arches. I went from having crazy flat feet where I'd like get out of a swimming pool and you'd see the, the shape of my foot, it looked like a paddle. And now it looks like a foot. We support all kinds of the bodies when they get injured. You know, when you have an arm injury, you get a sling. When you have a neck injury, you get a neck brace, etc. The only part of the body that we permanently brace, as far as I can tell, is the foot. So when people get arch supports, they get them for the rest of their lives. So what we say about arch support is that you are your own support if you have the ability to let yourself do that. Whether you have flat feet or high arches, the problem is almost always an issue of strength and use, not a question of needing more or less support. If your shoes make your foot muscles weak, and the arch supports basically then sort of rescue that arch from the weakness of those foot muscles, putting in that arch will alleviate the symptoms, but doesn't treat the cause of the problem, which is the weak foot. It would almost seem that the shoe companies that make billions of dollars selling shoes and orthotics would have some vested interest in making barefoot seem like a bad idea. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, it really, I, I don't know that it's that simple, but I don't think that it's that much more complicated. There's a debate that's going on, right? People like shoes that have arch supports and, and cushioning. As far as the minimalist shoes go, uh, I and the majority of podiatric community do not agree with it. We don't think it provides support to you. We don't think it helps you walk any better. It just looks fashionable and looks like you're a healthy person. I think in general, uh, my belief is that they're gonna cause more problems down the road. I'm a big proponent of wearing supportive shoes for your foot type. Every foot is not the same. 
what a flat foot needs, a high arch doesn't need. If your feet can tolerate it, then that's, that's fine. But there, it's not for everybody. And it's been very interesting. I've talked to podiatrists who've said the advent of the minimalist shoe has helped me as a podiatrist because it sent me patients. One of my all-time favorite things is when some doctor says, I love this whole barefoot idea. It's putting my kids through college. <laughs> I'm seeing more patients than ever. <laughs> I go, wait, wait, okay, first of all, you guys had the same joke 45 years ago when running shoes came out. Secondly, when someone comes in and they said they tried being barefoot and they got injured, did you ask them if they were actually barefoot? Because the difference between being barefoot and being in what most big shoe companies sell as a barefoot shoe is night and day. Most barefoot shoes are about as barefoot as a pair of stilts. I see a lot of stress fracture with people like this. People break their foot because there's not enough support for the for the foot. So the minimalist shoe idea is a good concept. I, you know, I like the idea, but it's not practical. If you've got perfect feet, everything's fine. You know, for short periods of time, sure, yeah, they're they could do just fine. But nobody's really going out and buying a flip flop to wear every day, unless you live on the beaches of California. Your feet are very adaptable. Your body is very adaptable. If you give it some stimulus, it will change. To look at the human foot, to understand why it is the way it is, you have to understand how we became first walkers and climbers, and then how we switched from being walkers and climbers to being walkers and runners. And we have the feet today of, of walkers and runners. Out of all the bones in your body, almost a quarter of them are in your feet. If you just think about it logically, this is not rocket science. Your feet have all these bones and all these muscles and all these ligaments and all that sensation for a reason. If you don't use it, you're not only losing it, but you might be losing a bunch of other functions as well. We know that humans have been running for millions of years. Um, in fact, we evolved to be really phenomenal runners around two million years ago. That meant that for the vast majority of human evolutionary history, for millions of years, we were running barefoot. It doesn't take more than a few seconds of thinking to realize Olympic athletes for thousands of years in Greece and Rome did that. And our ancestors for millions of years did that. What's the big deal? Well, back then, people lived to be 40. You won't live to be 100 now. You cannot do that to your feet. You need protection, you need support. I mean, think about it. You're running and you're pounding your foot against the ground. There's no, you have no support, you have no protection. How's your knee gonna feel? How's your ankle going to feel? It just doesn't make sense. You know, barefoot running it has cycled around. I've, I've seen it come and go a couple of times now. It was popular in the 80s as well as, you know, there were some people in the 60s that were running barefoot. First we had the normal shoe, the five finger shoes, minimalist shoes, and now we come to the thick shoes. So we're kind of evolving back and it's gonna be very interesting over time to see what comes after the shoes like the hokas that have the thicker heels. So now there's this whole thing about maximalist shoes with tons of padding and tons of support because the, some people didn't like the minimalist idea and someone just happened to have an idea that was the exact opposite. Um, if we think back prior to 45 years ago, every shoe was a minimalist shoe. It really let your foot move. It was a thin bit of leather. It was, it was closer to what we have than what you find now. Look what type of shoe gear they ran with in the 60s, in the 50s. There was no structure to them per se. Since the running craze in the early 70s to now, no matter what they have done to sneakers, the more padding, gel, air, uh, whatever they could put in there, really hasn't shown to decrease injuries. If you could prove that this shoe was better than your competitors, or even better than your last year's model, don't you think you would show that study where this one is scientifically better than this one? Because then you would own the universe. Why is it that in 45 years, that study's never happened? It's never happened because it's not possible. They've never done it. They can't do it. There's no evidence that supports that. I think we overvalue the extent to which shoes are solutions to problems. It's really more how you use your body than the shoes that are on your feet. It's just that shoes affect how your body works. If the shoe is only good as the person that's wearing it. So if you're not following a proper stance or a posture or a mechanic, the shoe can cause just as much harm as it could if you're wearing a regular shoe. It's all about alignment. So if the body is not aligned properly, it's going to accommodate, things are going to change, joints will move and change, and we get arthritis and things that shouldn't happen. So it's just all about why you want to go minimalist, 
um, what you're planning to do in a minimal issue, and how long you're going to do it. It's not about the footwear, it's about the form. It's about how you land, it's about how you use your feet. It just so happens that it's easiest to make those form changes when you're getting the feedback from the ground that you get when you're barefoot or close in a pair of zero shoes. I'm not saying the shoes are bad, right? Um, or that they should, shouldn't want to wear shoes. But we have to understand that everything, everything comes with costs and benefits, and shoes are no exception. When you can feel the difference between having your foot wrapped up in a cast, a regular shoe, or what we affectionately sometimes call foot coffins, um, versus being able to use your feet, you just don't want to go back. Is it a craze? Sure. But some people will stay with it. If that shoe works the way you say it works, then it's fine. If it's telling me to work for some guy in Colorado or New Zealand, it doesn't mean anything to me. If you feel comfortable in it, uh, then that's the shoe for you. Um, some people say, well, you know, the big shoe companies could compete with you. They could just come out and do it. And I'm not hugely worried about that. To do something this radical would almost be admitting that everything else you're selling is crap, is a lie. And no one's going to do that. Really, barefoot is best for your feet. But we live in a world um, that is obviously a shoe world nowadays. Everybody, in, mostly in, you know, in westernized society, we're wearing shoes. And you, you need to wear shoes in certain environments where you would really could run the risk of hurting your feet significantly. Who doesn't like to run barefoot? If you're running up a, a, across the lawn barefoot, you feel good. Um, would I run barefooted around here? No. You know, the reason that most people go barefoot is because they like to, I mean, at least in, in, term, in Western developed countries. And the reason that most people go barefoot in developing countries is because they have no choice. Soles for Souls collect new and gently worn shoes and then distribute them around the world to people who live in abject poverty and also they offer disaster relief to those in need. My friend and I went to Haiti in August of 2010, shortly after the earthquake, and um, we went there to distribute shoes for Souls for Souls. And when I went to Haiti, that was my first experience of extreme poverty. And the last day of our trip while we were there, um, our team was gathered in a room and we all went around the room. Everyone was to tell the story of how the couple days we had spent there had affected them. And it came to me and I opened my mouth and nothing came out. I began weeping. I knew that my heart was in trouble. And so uh, when I came back to Colorado, I knew I had to do something. And so I asked my husband if it was okay if I started collecting a few shoes in our garage. I sent one email to 20 people. And out of that, at this point, we've collected 270,000 pairs of shoes. I've been to Haiti four times and to Africa once to distribute shoes to those in need. And that's how, uh, that's how I got started. There's some days where we may collect six pairs of shoes. The next day we may get 600. So every day is very different, but every pair really, really matters to someone. Whoever is receiving that pair of shoes, it may be life-changing for them. Children in Haiti have to wear black shoes to school, so without black shoes, they can't go to school. For a child to not be able to have an education because they don't have a pair of shoes, is unbelievable. There are different orphanages and communities that we go into in Haiti and Tanzania, and these children are given a pair of shoes, and with that, they can receive an education. What we do is we provide shoes that provide an opportunity for people in Haiti and other third world countries to be able to provide for their families and be able to put food on the table for them. I know on the day I quit collecting shoes, there are people who won't eat. And that's what kind of drives me, is that I know what we're doing here in our little warehouse is a very important thing. It was so inspiring to meet someone like Michelle. It makes just tossing another bag of shoes onto the pile feel like it's not quite enough. I needed to do more. So I decided to go with Michelle and Souls for Souls to Haiti. With so many shoes, they were bound to need some help.
When I decided to do this project, something I wanted to learn more about was how diabetes affected people's feet. As a type 2 diabetic myself, I'm always worried about my feet. But first, I needed to find a doctor with some real experience. My name is Edward Mastoni. Sometimes people come in with just a little corn, flat feet, a lot of fractures, bunions, hematos, ingrown nails, trauma, um, infections, frostbite in the winter time, a worm in their foot, a cutaneous lava, lawnmower injuries, seashell injuries, plantar fasciitis. I used to see a lot of drug-induced abscesses in the, in the foot. They used to inject in the foot. This week, it's uh, kitchen knife week. I had two people who dropped the kitchen knife and cut the extensive tendons. You've been in practice long enough, you will see things. I think I found the right guy. Treating diabetics is a team effort. You need a, a good vascular surgeon, you need podiatrists, you need good wound care. Uh, it's something you can't treat on your own. Most primary care physicians are very good at sending uh, patients over for a yearly eval, and they're more attuned to checking their feet. They have a, usually a problem with their circulation, where the blood flow isn't that good, or they have a sensory impairment where they can't feel their feet those things lead to big problems. My name is Dr. Jocelyn Curry. I am a podiatric physician, meaning I treat all ailments of the foot and ankle. When it comes to diabetes and the feet, the feet can be definitely one of the early signs that changes are coming. The nerves in the feet are really important. And in diabetics, they tend to be affected first, meaning they don't feel sensation or feel pain as quickly as they used to. The nerves in the body run like wires from the spine to all the locations. So when they get affected by the blood glucose being too high, it makes them misfire and creates shooting, burning, tingling sensations in the feet. And over time, patients start to lose the sensation and not know when they have an injury. Your feet get damaged every day. So the blood goes in there, fixes it, and goes back. So now if your feet are diabetic, your, your feet gets damaged, not enough blood goes in there, and it doesn't heal. The biggest thing is hydration. Our feet are covered by our skin. The skin's the biggest organ in the body. It's a barrier to keep things out that aren't supposed to be in. So if your feet are dry, it's gonna crack and it's gonna cause fungus, bacteria, different things to get in that causes the infections that lead to the amputations. So hydration is key. Every time I'm on call, I have a diabetic foot infection. And it's usually something that has to go to the operating room on an urgent basis. Usually they uh, ignore the problem. I saw a little blood on my sock. I didn't think anything of it. Or I, I noticed a problem and I said, uh, I'll, I'll treat it Monday. By the time they went into the hospital, the whole toe was infected and the bone got infected. Once it reaches the bone and you have some necrotic tissue, you end up usually with an amputation. The difference between saving a toe and losing a toe is patient waiting. Diabetes is the number one cause of amputation. Um, so we try to prevent them losing their limb by building braces or building foot orthotics or providing them with shoes. That's part of my job. Um, then there are people that are dysvascular and there's a point where they end up losing their leg. Um, and that's where I come in with the prosthetics and I build them a prosthesis to return as much normalcy to their life as possible. So the first part of uh, designing a prosthetic is to build them a socket. The socket is the interface between them and the prosthesis. So we start with casting them, fill the model, I hand modify the casts, and then we wanna make sure they don't have rotation or fit issues, so we start with the socket. After the socket is fabricated, we select the different feet based on what this patient's goals are, what they wanna do. For instance, this leg has a vertical shock and a torsion adapter on it. Um, so this is for somebody that wants to be able to uh, pivot and the pivot takes place here. Also, the vertical shock reduces the strain on the bottom of the residual limb. This kind of represents kind of the inside of what the prosthetic looks like. Uh, we have an alignment fixture. We can change the alignment, which is the orientation of the foot to the socket uh, when they're walking and, and fine tune that. This foot flexes and springs. So when they're walking, they get some energy return and push off. So it propels them forward. Getting that patient to not only walk, but walk well, um, is really important. There's two types of diabetes. Um, there's type one and there's type two. There's juvenile diabetes and adult onset diabetes. Um, they're both very serious. Um, they can be managed. Um, 
some people have it very severely and some people don't have it so bad. So just because you said that you're a diabetic does not mean that you're gonna end up with an amputation or foot loss. It just puts you at a very high risk of that in the future. My mother was diagnosed with diabetes in her early to mid 30s. And uh, she was a type two diabetic and was insulin dependent. She um, tended to regulate her blood sugar with her insulin instead of trying to do it with diet. When she first was diagnosed with um, diabetes, she drank Coke, regular Coke, just like always. And if her blood sugars were up, she just would uh, give herself more insulin. And it, that's not how you're supposed to do it, I mean, <laughs> but that's how she did. And she didn't pay attention to her diet. She just didn't try to let the diabetes affect her life. And it does, it, it, it be, it's a life changer. It should be, at least in the way that you uh, take care of your body. My mother ended up having an amputation. She got a sticker in her toe. And one of the things that they tell you to do is pay attention to your feet. If you get an infection, you know, you need to get to the doctor right away and, and get on top of it as quickly as possible because the circulation is so bad that you don't heal like you should. So uh, we had to set up an appointment to get her toe amputated. And about four weeks later, we were back in having another amputation and they took her leg just below the knee. So. I've been a stylist for 27 years. Uh, done hair, massage, facials, feet. <laughs> we do have diabetic patients that come in for foot care. A lot of times they can't pick their foot up to reach it to be able to trim their toenails and they need to be very careful to keep their toenails trimmed because as the toenails get long, you scratch yourself in your sleep. So by keeping the feet trimmed, it helps to keep them safe. I just realized with my mother being having the health issues she's had over the years with her diabetes that how how important that the safety of doing the manicures and pedicures was. When I went to try to figure out what pedicure chairs to use, I tried to find something that had the least amount of mechanisms and pipes. It seems as though whirlpools and objects harbor bacteria. When the spa company started coming out with different types of pedicure thrones, everybody loved them. They thought they were awesome because they came with the nice massagers in the back of the chairs and everybody wanted the water to stay warm and to move like a whirlpool. So when they started them, they put a whirlpool jet system in them, just like you would see in a hot tub. So the water goes out around through like a warmer and would go through pipes in the bottom of the chair. What they found was, even though you would run disinfectant through that, there's always that chance that some of that would get left behind, bacteria could build up, and that's why they became so unpopular and pretty much non-existent anymore now. So when they came out with pipeless, which is basically the same throne with a tub at the bottom, and then instead of having the water move out and inside of the tub, it just circulates inside of the tub with just a little fan. That fan, that motor, the whole little thing comes off, it gets disinfected. The water you see in there is the water your feet touches that nobody else's does. It never went anywhere else, it's just like a sink. It fills up and it drains. Plus we go another step by putting a liner inside of the tub to protect against any bacteria or anything so that when the next person comes, they know it's going to be clean and ready to go. It takes time to clean those tubs. And it takes time to fill them up, put the solution in there, run it through, drain them, fill them back up again. It's part of who I am as far as a business person when I think about the pedicure chairs and the safety of the clients that come in. I mean, if my mother was sticking her feet in that tub, would I feel confident to know that she was gonna be safe? When we're thinking about the history of foot washing in the Bible, it has a long history in the Hebrew Testament or the Old Testament as it's sometimes called. And it's just a way of when somebody comes into your home of showing them hospitality, which is also a sign of dignity, a sign of respect, and also it's a way of honoring God. The main source of our knowledge and understanding of the washing of the feet with Christ is in John's Gospel, chapter 13. This is at the end of the dinner, at the end of the Passover, the most sacred meal, completely against what they ever would have anticipated at the end of the meal, Jesus, who is their rabbi, their lord, their master, their teacher, who they look up to, takes off his garments and gets down on his knees to wash their feet. Well, this would have been unheard of. 
that uh, the master would get down to wash the disciples' feet. And so Peter, who so often is the spokesman for the disciples, says, Lord, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus says, uh, if I don't wash your feet, then you will never be able to understand completely who I am and what you're doing. And what's significant here too is that we have accounts um, that in the early, early church, the washing of the feet continued. And so clearly people uh, in the early life of the church recognized that when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he was doing something very significant and something that we are to carry on. And then here we are doing it even uh, today. Making this movie has been a lot of hard work. And with all of this traveling, my feet have been killing me. Why not take a little time to really pamper myself? I mean, all guys get pedicures, right? My name is Carolina de Peña. Um, here we are at Polish Nail Bar in Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic. This place is like very girly, <laughs> but we have clients that are men and like to do their feet and nails. With men, we need more time than for women because their feet are very rough. So it's more time for me to put the employer and do their feet than for a girl. My name is Georgette Sands. I'm the proprietor of the nail lounge located in Nassau, Bahamas. Usually men are afraid to come in here. They say it looks too girly. But the minute they walk through the door and they actually sit down in our chairs and they have our service, they want to come back. We've had men that book appointments every three weeks and they just love it in here. I don't know if it's because a lot of women are in here, but they seem to like the condition of their feet that we are encouraging them to groom their feet. And a lot of them may have never had a pedicure before. But the minute we speak to them and say, just try it out, try it out, and it seems as though it's catching on, they want to come back very often. I would like to see more men in, in particular, because whilst men like women with nice feet, women like men with nice feet. My name is Dina, and this is the co-owner. It's also my loving husband, Tom. I just don't like feet. It's kind, of, it's, it's kind of ludicrous that I'm part owner of a nail salon because I don't know. It's, it's, it's like it's like the far end of your colon. I mean, I know you got one, but I don't want to touch it. I don't want to smell it. Just you know, keep it yourself. We welcome every shape, every looks, every crooked toenail there is. And at this time, I exercise my Fifth Amendment rights. <laughs> you know, a lot of times, women comes in here and they always tells me how they wish to bring their husband to get their pedicure because it's bugging them. Uh, feet creates a lot of odor. There might be stats somewhere on how many divorces were caused by stinky feet. Huh? Is that possible? It is possible. Men attracts the women more so if they got their manicure and the pedicure done. <laughs> to tell you honestly, it's true. Men, get your feet taken care of as a chick magnet. I think when you come in and get the pedicure done, and I think the, your partner will be happy to see you get a nail and toe done and make you feel nice and better to go with that person. There's a stigma for men having their feet done. And I had the same perception. It was, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's something for ladies. It's something the ladies do. When a, a male client comes in here for the first time, just because their wives said so and the moment they sat down and you start working on their calluses during the process you can you can see on their faces with the ah uh, it's quite a bit more comfortable if you're standing around doing whatever you're doing without these big thick calluses on your feet a lot of men and women doesn't realize that until they actually come here and says 
Wow. I never thought that I needed this. When I get done with the pedicure, I feel like I have Air Jordan shoes on. <laughs> and it's so amazing. I mean, the difference coming in versus when I leave here and after a pedicure. I'm a diabetic. Uh, I have a neuropathy, so it's really important to me from a health standpoint, comfort standpoint, things of that nature. Pedicures are very, very popular, and especially men. Once you can get a guy to come get a pedicure, they're pretty much hooked. The greatest thing about nail polish, toe polish, getting a manicure, getting a pedicure, is that nails can be done by almost anyone. The professional gives you the best. But if you can't afford to go to the salon, you can easily do your own nails and make them look good with the products that are out there today. You're immediately glamorous when you have beautiful nails and beautiful feet. Uh, my name is Jeff Pink, and basically we have two brands in my company. There is one brand which is called Orly, and there is another brand which is called Spa Ritual. In 1975, I opened a beauty supply store in Tarzana, California. At that time, I used to carry other people's products. But listening to the manicurist and what the needs are, I felt that there is more than that. I can come with my own product. Keep in mind, at that time, the only thing which was available to the manicurist was base coat, top coat, and nail color. No strengthener, no fast dry, nothing of that uh, business. In the last 38 years or 39 years of the company, I developed 26 nail treatments covering every issue, every needs that a consumer as well as the professional nail technician needs to perform their services. There's so many cool things out there. We have a product line called Spa Ritual that we use. It was one of the first vegan lines that had been out that was new and developed from a company called Orly that's been around forever, that everyone has trusted and relied on over years and years and years of time. One day I said to myself, Jeff, you develop so many products, but you never develop an application of a product, how to apply it differently. I took a regular cap, which is usually it's a very hard plastic, and was able to cover it in a special mold with rubber on the outside. The cap is user-friendly for a manicurist. I can just open this bottle and close it with no problem. On top of it, because it's made out of rubber and you have a very good grip, and the cap, when you apply the nail polish, you get more accuracy. I can get into little teeny tiny fingernails or people that don't have a little baby toenail, I can polish them with this polish. It's one of the best innovation in nail polish application ever. From the very youngest person who applies their nail polish or their toenail polish, to the, to the 90 year old woman, there's just been a just an explosion of nail art polishes. Some companies have as many as 140 different colors. Some of them have gold in them. Some of them have gold dust in them, diamond dust in them, sparkles in them. So much is being added to the nails and to the feet today to make them really glamorous. Right now, nail art has taken a big resurgence. Some of the younger women are painting every nail red and one white, or they're getting some kind of artwork. There is so much publicity about nails now. There's so much on the internet. There's so many styles that you can pick from. There's a magazine like Nail It that's on the newsstand to show people what's available to them. Of course, if you're in New York City, you're going to have a much more sophisticated look than perhaps somebody that is in Kansas. The difference between polish trends in Kansas and the Midwest, as opposed to um, California or New York, trends tend to be a little bit different. It took us a while to pick up some of their trends. It doesn't take as long as some people think, especially with internet, Pinterest. I mean, good Lord, there's everything. It's immediate anymore with, you know, so trends that may have taken longer before to get to Kansas don't as much anymore. That, especially the younger ones, they're like, they're all over it. You can go online today and you can find 
not hundreds, not thousands, but literally millions of nail designs and nail pictures, what to do with it, how to do it, the different colors that are available. It's really just been an explosion, unlike the beauty industry has ever seen. As a matter of fact, nails has taken the biggest jump in profits and in sales in the last two years than any other cosmetic on the market today. Bigger than makeup, bigger than hair, bigger than tanning, Nails is uh, just jumping to the forefront of what beauty is all about. Right now, nails are trendy. For example, you want to go to a fashion uh, event or a wedding. You want to combine your nails with your outfit. Nails and feet today are the perfect fashion accessory. A woman can do anything with her nails and with her feet to make them look glamorous, to fit in with her fashion, her dress. Today, they can put nails on that look exactly like the dress that you're going to wear. It could have the same pattern as the dress you're going to wear. So in today's society, truly a woman is not dressed unless her hands and feet are dressed as well. Feet is very important to the fashion industry. Perception is reality. Um, when, when it comes to branding in the, in the fashion industry, you want to make sure you have the whole package, whether that's a photo shoot, whether that's a face shot, whether it's a full body shot, swimsuit, you wanna make sure your presentation is on point. Also for runway, they're gonna look at the clothes, they're gonna look at the walk, but the feet is definitely gonna be looked at the most. Without perfect feet, you have no package. We see a lot of perfect feet that are out there. However, we know all photo shoots are pretty much airbrushed a little bit, but you gotta have a solid foundation. So we tend to go with the more younger models, more petite to where the bone is strong, the skin isn't as scarred, and to try to really look for that perfect image. We're working with big time clients and branding is very important. One bad image in a magazine could take a company down. The model selection is one thing that's extraordinarily important. Hands, feet, face, and body. We need to find the whole package and that's not easy. Being a hand model is a very difficult thing and being a foot model is very, very difficult. My ability to be a foot model over 20 years and to be continually booked has a lot to do with my lifestyle. Um, it's not only the manicures and pedicures and um, the sloughing of dead skin and things like that and the techniques that I've learned. I have the ability to get the shot really quickly. I could show up with no nail polish on and have absolutely clear toenails. Most people actually can't do that even if, if they're professional um, foot models. What makes my feet perfect is the arch, the fact that there are um, no calluses, that the toes are straight, and the first toe is the longest toe, and they go down in size. It's not enough to show up and just have pretty feet. You have to really know what you're doing. That's how you keep the work coming in, you know? And then you gotta remember to have fun with it, you know, because it's just feet. Back in 1992, many years ago, you might not see the gray, but many moons ago, I competed in the Miss Bahamas uh, pageant, and uh, I'm so grateful to have won that year and represented the Bahamas in Mexico City in 1993 um, at the Miss Universe pageant. I don't think I would have been able to compete in today's Miss Universe because the six inch heels are killers. Um, I'm so grateful that I competed when I did compete and maybe three inch heels. <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. Um, that got you by. I never recommend my patients to wear high heels. Women like love their high heels. Uh, and um, it's a love-hate relationship. It's hard to be in a high heel or a pump because they're not made to really be comfortable. With the styles being as long and as pointy as they are, women's feet just get crushed into these, these shoes that destroy our feet. When you have the high heels and the way you gotta put your foot in there and the way your foot is in there for a sustained period of time, uh, we start to develop some bunions. Most every woman that wears high heels will experience a burning sensation on the ball of their foot because of course when you're in an elevated position such as this, all of the pressure is falling onto the ball of the foot and the fat pad. And if you wear four to six inch heels every day, eventually it's gonna catch up to you. I probably wear high heels seven days a week, you know, 
48 weeks a year, and my feet know that I've worn these shoes, let me tell you. People comment on how are you able to stand up in those heels? Well, it's because I take my slippers to work with me, so as soon as I take a break, I'm back, I'm back down. Take them off as often as you can. If you're sitting at a desk, take them off while you're at your desk and, and stretch your feet out and those kinds of things. You know, if you talk to foot doctors, they'll say, oh, this is really bad for you. You know, it'd be really bad for my social life if I wasn't wearing heels once in a while. I like them if you wear them for the right time. You're going out, you're having a nice dinner, and you're dressed up for a special occasion. That's, that's fine. You know, when you wear a high heel, it makes your pelvis tip in a different way. So it's sexier. Shouldn't say this, but <laughs> I love a woman in high heel shoes. <laughs> My name is Sarah Ray. Um, I own True Love Shoes in Denver. What I specialize in is women's shoes that are trendy, not necessarily brand name driven, because trends change so fast. And that's why when you have shoes that are all $38 or less and boots that are $58 or less, that's gonna be something that is gonna be an easy thing for people to be like, yeah, I'm getting that. I'm not gonna think about it, I'm gonna get it. The red shoe is like a classic, iconic, like it's the shoe. It's gonna be a pump and it's gonna be red and it's, you know, it's just burned in the brain. And this is like the end all be all red shoe. It's super glamorous, it's covered in stones, it's just gorgeous. If the man is choosing the shoe, this is the shoe. It's not gonna be the green shoe, the yellow shoe, it's the red shoe that's been ingrained in his mind and his psyche probably from childhood. You know, Dorothy had the red shoes. The red shoe sounds like the best of both worlds because the color red is highly sexualized and it creates a, an emotional response of lust, passion. We see a lot of symbols of red in our culture, red roses, so red shoes combined with a sexy foot, I can see that being a highly eroticized form for a potential, you know, foot fetishist. Fetishism in general is described as a intense sexual arousal to an object. So if we think about foot fetishism, a foot is actually a part of the body, so it's less of a fetish and more of what we like to call a partialism. So this intense attraction to a part of the body. And it usually is associated with sexual arousal. So there's two types of people with this sort of partialism or sexual preference. Some can only be aroused by the presence of that object object, being the foot, or others, there is no other uh, type of interference in sexual arousal in their relationship, but there is a preference, a real strong interest or intensity around feet. You know, shoes are an actually interesting part of foot fetish, and if we look in the culture that we have historically, we have things like honeymooners and newlywed couples that are going on their honeymoon, they would tie shoes to the back of the car as they drive off to be, you know, together supposedly for the first time, and that was supposed to represent fertility and good luck in the marriage. And we've seen that internationally. Even fairy tales like Cinderella, where it was the small foot would be the, the foot that gets the prince. So in the original story, before it was adapted by Disney, the prince was sort of a foot fetishist himself. And he said, whoever can fit their small foot in the slipper will be my bride. So in the original story, there were women and sisters with ugly feet, which were, they were described as cutting off toes and squeezing into this small slipper in order to be considered beautiful. The original Cinderella story isn't that far from reality in the women cutting off their toes and to fit into the smaller shoe. In early history, women were actually cutting off toes or slicing off sides of the feet to make them more narrow or to fit into the smaller shoe because that was a sign of femininity and beauty. And today, we're seeing a lot of surgeries around feet or altering the feet just like any other part of the body to make it appear more sexy or more feminine because that's linked to body image and how women are perceiving themselves. My name is Sean Ravai, I'm a podiatrist. When general podiatrists see all foot problem, my practice is mostly focused on younger women who don't like the way their feet look. Very common, ugly toes or ugly feet, they want it to look better and they don't like the way it looks. 
Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Great, great. What brings you in today? So I was um, interested in learning about what you'd be able to do to make my feet look prettier. Okay. So what exactly bothering you about your feet? I'm interested in kind of fixing the shape of my big toes. Okay, um, yes. I'm not really happy with in them. this area? Yes, especially the bunion area. Yes, yes. Um, I feel like it's just way too narrow up at the top and much wider down there. So I definitely like to kind of fix the shape up. Yeah, what we can do for you, you have really wide feet. Mm -hmm. You can make it a little bit narrower because most shoes are narrow. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be hard for you to wear most shoes. Right. So most people have like a feet like this. Your feet like this, right. spread out. So you can push these bones in. Okay. Be a little bit narrower, like this. You'll feel like that this mm -hmm. afterwards. Okay. And how would you go about making my feet narrower? We have to reshape your bones and fix some bone, put them in the right position. Your bones are not in the right position right now, so that's why you have this bump on the side. Okay. It's very common with women. And so after the procedure, um, if I went forward with the procedure, how long would it take like for recovery? The recovery can walk the same day, but for you to wear your regular shoes, it might take a few weeks. Okay. You cannot wear high heel shoes for about a few weeks or so. Okay. We have to take an x-ray, see whether we have to reshape the bone or mm -hmm. break the bone, which bones we have to take care of, how much we have to move it over. Sounds good. I've had a few people who came to me and they told me their big toe is fat. They wanted a life suction of their fat, their big toe done. Yeah, I mean, they're right. They, they, the toe was fat. They were right, but I didn't think, I mean, a lot of women, they wanted to wear the shoes and they, they were hiding the big toe. All the toes were nice except the big toe, so we made the toe, so took some fat out of it, and it was a lot better now. Liposuction for toes. For the toe, with the big toe, yeah. I have had patients who have requested liposuction of the foot. Mm -hmm. um, in my hands, I don't think it's appropriate. I, I'm not trained in it, I don't do it. But it's a request, and that goes more towards cosmetic surgery. Every surgery has its risk. I just, I don't see the purpose in taking that risk of an infection or something going wrong or not healing properly um, just for the look of it. When women feel they have bigger toes, bigger feet, it becomes, am I feminine enough? And these surgeries or these cosmetic procedures become a way to capitalize on that and guarantee if we can change the appearance of your foot, it'll take care of your feeling about your body image and self-esteem will improve. But I don't, you know, I find that a lot of those issues for women are more deeply rooted. You may fix the foot, but you still remain depressed or unhappy or you'll find something else that you don't like about your body. And we see that a lot with body dysmorphic disorder. It becomes this distorted, unrealistic image of a perceived defect when a lot of that isn't realistic. It's created in the mind and it becomes an obsession or compulsion around that thinking that I'm not normal, I'm not right and I want to change my appearance in order to feel perfect. So Anastasia, you decided to go ahead and get the surgery done. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to make this decision? Um, I decided to have the surgery done because I was unhappy with the shape of my feet. Um, I wanted them to look prettier and also just be more comfortable when I wore shoes. So that's kind of what made me decide to go for it and have the surgery done. Feet represent a symbol of health and we spend a lot of time grooming and taking care of our feet. Our feet, you know, transport us everywhere we go. For women, historically, you know, women with smaller feet were more feminine. My name is Jo Farrell. I'm a documentary photographer and cultural anthropologist. I have been photographing traditions and cultures that are dying out for many years. About 10 years ago, I had an exhibition in London and decided to focus more on women's traditions. One of my first thoughts was uh, women with bound feet. I'd been in and out of Asia for over 20 years, so I was using my contacts, but everyone just said there was no one left alive who had bound feet. I was very fortunate to be in Shanghai and was driving along. Uh, the driver told me, I overheard your conversation and my grandmother has bound feet. So his grandmother, Zhang Yongying was one of the first women that I photographed with bound feet. She 
uh, let me take this photograph within the first hour of actually meeting her. I wasn't expecting her to do that. Normally I talk more to my subjects, but she wanted um, to take her shoes and socks off pretty soon after I met her. And it was the start of something big that actually going through and documenting these women. The history of foot binding is slightly curious. No one has real definition of how and when it started. It is believed to have started in the Shang Dynasty. There are stories of emperors in China, particularly Li Yu. He was an emperor who had a courtesan who would dance on lily pads. She was so favored by Emperor Yu that other courtesans decided to bind their feet so that they would gain favor from the emperor. And it mainly happened in the rich families, the elite, but like any tradition or fashion, it went down through the classes to the peasant farmers. Uh, it wasn't done throughout China. It was the Han Chinese in the central parts that had their feet bound. It is believed at the height of foot binding, between 40 to 50 percent of women in China had their feet bound. A woman who had bound feet would be considered a good wife. She had been through a lot of pain and suffering. She was more likely to be more subservient, to not complain. What would happen is matchmakers would go to all the villages and find suitable young girls who they could match make with young boys. Typically, the mother-in-law, one of their requirements was that the daughter-in-law would have to have bound feet. So when a child was young, they knew that they were already betrothed to somebody and it was expected that she had bound feet. How they actually bound the feet was by using a long piece of cloth. So if you imagine, the small toes would all be underneath the foot with a large toe, the big toe still out, and it would be bound round the foot, then back round the heel, so it actually would lift the foot up into the heel. And if you see the x-rays of it, you'll see that a lot of the foot was going upwards. And so creating it so that the heel was nearer the metatarsals, would make a smaller foot. They would be then made to walk and their own weight would break the small toes beneath them. They tell me that it was extremely excruciating during the first year, as you can imagine. In some ways, the mothers of these daughters having their feet bound, they did it so that their daughters would have had a better life. Um, they knew if they bound their daughter's feet, they could get married, they could have a family, they would have more land. Uh, without that, they would have a poor, difficult life. For centuries, they had been trying to stop foot binding. The big change happened after the Opium War. There was a lot of foreigners coming into the ports of China, into Shanghai, and it changed how China internally perceived itself because it could see that it would look uh, unfavorably with the women with bound feet. They originally tried to ban foot binding in 1911. Sun Yat-sen came into power and it was the start of the Republic of China. This had stopped in the actual cities by 1911, but it carried on, especially in rural areas, up until 1949 when it finally was stopped they would go around to villages and forcibly remove the binding. If they were found with uh, feet bound, one of the ways of stopping them was to find them um, or to take the bindings and hang them in the windows of the woman's house so that she would be ashamed that her neighbors would see that she had done something wrong. The typical lotus foot was between three and four inches. All the women I've documented have had uh, much larger feet, and partly that was because they had unbound their feet and they were allowed to spread out. So none of them actually really achieved the small, perfect foot. But I believe with all my heart that they are proud of what they achieved. They will always tell me when I look at their feet, my feet were smaller. When, you know, when it was actually done, it was, you know, it was much, 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 so I think that is with pride because it was an achievement that they made. They lived in a society where 
it was considered beautiful and the best thing to do to actually reduce the size of their feet. But during their lifetime and their generation, it was then turned with the, the Cultural Revolution that it was now considered something that they should be ashamed of and they were mocked for. So they have both this side of them that they thought it was a good thing and they also thought it was a bad thing. Any of these women, I think that the pain and suffering they went through, even if they haven't got the most perfect foot, I think they achieved a great thing that they went through this and were able to marry into another peasant family that had more land or more sheep or something more than what they had. To capture these women before uh, they have you know, all passed away, I think is an important decision, important project to do. It seems throughout history, feet have been viewed as objects of beauty, not only for their size and shape, but sometimes for the artwork that people add to them. The weather starts to get nice and the shoes start to come off and the flip-flops go on. That's when people really want to get their feet tattooed. Usually it's just something feminine is what they're looking for, you know, swirly stars, you know, quotes, you know, pretty stuff that, you know, girls like. I am not a girly girl. <laughs> I am more of a tomboy. I was never really raised to be a prissy little girl. <laughs> I have three daughters and we had discussed getting a mother-daughter tattoo been throwing it around for about two years. So we actually got a little more serious about it, trying to come up with the designs. Um, we came up with one, and so far I'm the first one to go get that tattoo. <laughs> the design of my tattoo, it's infinity with the word family incorporated into it, and that's what we wanted because infinity is forever and family is forever. So we wanted those two things to be incorporated in a tattoo, and then we would each personalize it to fit us. My first intent was to put it on the back of my shoulder, but when I went in, the tattoo artist, we talked a little bit more about it, and it would be more visible on my foot since during the summertime I do wear sandals, and I decided, sure. This was my first experience with a tattoo. Figured it's something that would tie me and my daughters at this point together. And I figured, hey, I'm 50. Another thing off my bucket list. <laughs> customer will meet with the general manager and he already kind of starts working with them and determine which artist would be the best artist for that. Based on the ideas they have, they may already have pictures, they may already have ideas. As long as they have a basic range of what they do like and what they don't like, they'll sit with the artist and, and what we call a consultation. Then the artist will come up with a concept after they speak with them for a while, draw it up. Other times it's the image, if it's a realistic tattoo, it's the image taken straight from the picture that the artist will use. A lot of people want to have the art on their feet. Um, you know, because of the limited space of the foot, some designs can be put on there, but we do get names, uh, flowers, butterflies, filigrees, uh, infinity signs, things like that, or, or even more elaborate stuff that will start at the top of the foot and work its way up into the ankle and then connect with something else. So it, it comes out pretty nice. I saw something kind of like this on a woman's feet in a tattoo magazine when I was like 13 and it's stuck in my head ever since. Trying to get all the painful spots out of the way before I'm older and don't want to do it anymore. You've got a lot of nerve endings in your feet, you know, we're very ticklish on our feet, so it's not like the most common place to tattoo because it is, you know, of course, a more painful spot. It's also a much more difficult spot to tattoo. 
The foot hurts. The foot hurts. Everywhere on that foot, it hurts. Yes, I'm about to get my first tattoo here at Miami Tattoo Company, South Beach, Miami. Wish me luck. I'm kind of afraid of this process, but we're gonna give it a shot. Okay guys, here we go. <laughs> With my new tattoo, I was starting to think that maybe I had the perfect foot. But it wasn't long before I got a call from Dr. Christian, telling me there was one more person that I needed to meet. All I remember from that day was I left for work, and I went back home, and took a shower, and had to go run some errands, and that's all I remember. In April of 2014, Kristen Hopkins lost control of her vehicle and tumbled 140 feet down an embankment near Fairplay, Colorado. She was trapped for over five days before a passing motorist found Kristen, still alive inside her overturned car. I don't remember the accident, and all I remember is waking up in the car, and I just knew something was not right with my, with my, uh, with my feet. I don't remember Flight for Life taking me to the hospital or anything. I remember waking up in ICU. I had to be told numerous times a day what happened, that I was in an accident, that my feet were amputated. I was not in lucid, basically, for a good week. So I think that's how I was able to accept this more, because it wasn't, uh, I woke up one morning, and oh my god, my feet weren't there. It was a constant you had your feet amputated. I think the gradual realization of what happened was easier on me. The first time standing up was very interesting. I mean, you do physical therapy every day in the hospital and rehab to make sure that you're strong enough and whatnot to stand up because for two months I was bedridden. The first pair of feet that I had, the prosthetist gave me 10 pages of feet and was like, okay, you pick one. And I'm like, I don't know what they're supposed to do. I wasn't really thrilled with how they were treating me and everything, so I, I asked my orthopedic doctor, you know, what he re recommended, and I moved over to Christian and, and Creative Technologies. I was really glad Kristen came and saw us. We were having a Saturday fitting with Kristen, and she was doing pretty well. We left her in her current feet. We just made new sockets for her. I liked the feet that she was in. They had the shock, they had the torsion. I thought they were appropriate. But then I started listening to Kristen more and she's like, I love everything, but I really hate it when I go down a ramp. I really hate it when I have to walk up a hill. So I'm thinking, and I chase Kristen out to the car and I says, we need to talk. I says, we need to talk about your feet because if that is an issue, we need to address that. And there are feet that we can talk about that have microprocessors that will pick your foot up, put your foot down when you're walking down a hill, it'll level you out. So she got in these and they changed her life. So this is kind of the guts of the, the foot. Uh, her prosthetic is held on with a vacuum. Uh, every time she steps down on the heel, it activates this pump here. And this pump is, this line here is drawing air out of the bottom of the socket. 
and this seals it at the top. That's why she has those sleeves on. And this is a, a, a microprocessor foot, so it adjusts to uh, terrain. She's going down a slope. The feet recognize that and they point their feet down and keep them to sit 90 degrees. If she's going up a hill, the feet will dorsiflex and let her go up a hill. So they, they adjust to the terrain. You take walking for granted and when you don't have feet, it's kind of like, oh, okay. It is what it is. I can't change what happened to me. So it's, um, you know, am I gonna sit in a room and cry all day long or am I gonna go live my life and show my kids that, you know, nothing can stop me. So after traveling so many miles and talking with so many people, I'm still left asking myself, what is a perfect foot? Is it a finely toned foot? A well-worn foot? A beautiful foot? A manicured foot? Maybe it's a natural foot? A well-supported foot? Or could it even be a robotic foot? Maybe in the end, the idea of a perfect foot is really just a myth. Next time you're at a beach or a pool, just look at other people's feet. And when you see somebody go by, and you'll say, wow, look at that girl. She's got big bunions. She looks like she's in her 20s. And then you'll see other people, and wow. Very rarely do I see a perfect foot. But when you do see a perfect foot, you realize it. Very, very few and far between. Feet are feet, and you walk on your feet. <laughs> so perfect feet are feet that are functional. For me, perfect feet are ones that work. I don't care how they look. I don't care, uh, I, just, I just want to know that they work. That's a big deal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten toes, which is what mothers usually do when babies come into the world. Let's see, do they have ten toes and ten fingers? Perfect, there you go. <laughs> well, she's got a point there. Thanks, Miss Bahamas. And speaking of the Bahamas, it's time to go back home for the annual Junkanoo celebration. Come here and rock me, baby. Come here and hold me. Boy, don't you talk, just show me. Show me you want to control me. Yeah. Oh, no. Don't you, don't you let me go. 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 Don't you let me go Boy, don't you know I see ya Baby, I wanna please ya Promise I'll never leave ya You are my king and me need ya Ooh. Oh no Don't you, don't you let me go Don't you, don't you let me go Don't you, don't you let me go don't you, don't you let me go. 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 Keep talking. Don't you, don't you let me go. Don't you, don't you let me go. Don't you, don't you let me go. Keep talking. Don't you, don't you let me go. 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 Sweet like sugar, nice like wine. You and me together to the end of time. Oh no, oh no. Sweet like sugar, nice like wine. You and me together to the end of time. Oh no, oh no, baby. Sweet like sugar, nice like wine. You and me together to the end of time. Oh, yeah. 
Now we can go home and have a feet sex 